Hello, good morning, everybody. So I'm very happy to be here this morning, and I'm from Euroclear. I'm solution architect in the Group Digital Capability Division, and I'm part of the, the Innovation Tribe. So today we will discuss about quite... Uh, I'm quite enthusiastic about blockchain technology. It's quite a fascinating topic, and we will look at if these blockchain technologies in the financial sector, is it a myth? or is this really becoming a reality? So we will look at it under the perspective of a, high, a hitchhiker guys that's going to travel this blockchain journey. So if we take the analogy that we want to build a DLT platform for the financial sector, and let's say for the purpose of the presentation that I will mention a rocket, so we will build a blockchain rocket to visit different use cases. And here, for the purpose of the presentation, we put different galactic destinations. So the question is, can we, thanks to a blockchain platform, enable those capabilities? So can we have transformed the money in something that is programmable? Can we tokenize financial instruments like bonds, uh, securities, uh, any kind of financial instrument, can we transform accounts that are currently defined it on the mainframe with cryptographic digital token? Can we have instantaneous settlement? So what does it mean? And atomic, if you have a seller of a financial product and a buyer, can we at the same time be sure that we change the ownership of it? Can we provide better control so that the, the owner of financial assets really as sovereign, so control them. They can decide to who they give it. They have the keys to, to change the ownership. And can we also consider that, you probably have the one uh, aware of the, G, uh, the blockchain technology, have followed the DeFi, so it's decentralized finance, it's all the crypto stuff. Can we consider those guys as like a real life lab that can be an inspiration for building a blockchain platform for regulated financial sector. So before traveling to new highs, we first need, as a good engineer, to build that DLT-based rocket. So first, we need new architecture design pattern. That's the first thing. And we will look at what's different here. So we need change. During decades, financial sector has used specific patterns to build uh, application and platform like the mainframe for the financial services, they have used specific approach and we observe that it doesn't fit. So those architecture approach, you cannot use them anymore if you decide to offer the service I mentioned with a blockchain-based platform. So we are really assisting to a new decentralized paradigm and we are really shifting from centralized monolithic application development to something really decentralized, which has to be modular, containerized, and it has to be really agile, as you will see when you build this kind of, of rocket. So what we observe, the different decentralized actors, so for those probably not familiar with the financial sector, so I, I took some of them, so the issuers are those actors that issue financial instruments like bonds, securities, investors, those are the ones who buy them. And then you have financial institution in the middle, like Euroclear, which is a financial market infrastructure. And we observe that re they require more and more privacy, control, transparency on the operation, and the list is very long. They want auditability, uh, traceability. They are also more and more uh, actors in that ecosystem that require to be also sovereign on the IT infrastructure. So this kind of service, they say, look, we would like to own also our own node, and I will explain what it is. We want to run part of the infrastructure on our cloud, if they have a cloud, or on our own data center. So you see there is a change. That's the first part. Now, when designing this kind of platform here, we put on the slide six proven architecture stack principles, so it's really coming from the practice, so it's not something theoretical, it's the way we observe, we build this kind of DLT-based platform for the financial sectors, so that that's, those principles have been 
test it, try and approve by different uh, projects on this, and we are experimenting on this. So a first one, when you want to build a DLT-based platform, we observe that using microservice infrastructure is really uh, a key point. So you will see there are lots of components that are evolving. We have to update them. We have to be fast, adaptive, and all the characteristics of microservice that people have explained it, I think, yesterday in several presentations. Uh, we need also uh, an automation. So we need to have good pipeline to deploy all those components. Second principle is really when you design this kind of rocket, and don't forget when I mention rocket here, it's to mention a DLT-based platform for the financial sector. It's important to have layers to decouple because you will see the complexity of the, of the machinery. So you have really to decouple the infrastructure layer where you will run your different components, then the blockchain layer on top of it where you will have the different nodes. Uh, above, you have different core services like uh, identity provider, access control. Then you have your access layer with all the different kinds of API. You have also other ways to consume it through web API. A third uh, stack principle is having, when you build this kind of platform from day one, it has to be modular and agile. So it's really a pluggable model-oriented architecture. So you will take one use case like doing settlement of securities versus cash, and you will focus on that user journey and really enable just the module that you need on that rocket to play that early journey. So you plug some module, you have to have these capabilities, and even each module, when you go into the, your different sprint and user journey, you will progressively add features on them. So that's a key point also. The platform also has to be adaptive scaling. You will not start from day one with super big booster. So you will start your journey probably with small booster, and depending on the activity of the platform, the number of transactions, you need to have the capabilities to improve it, so to scale horizontally the platform. Uh, a fifth point is interoperability. So try as much as you can to use standard method protocol. Uh, if it's, for example, you will see the blockchain platform is not only blockchain you need to access, so try to use, if it's for authentication, use OpenID Connect, OAuth. Uh, if it's for API, use Open API. You will need also to integrate with legacy system because we are still on early journey on blockchain, so the majority of the financial sector is still on legacy platform, so you need to connect to those platform and also to external uh, systems. And then the last point is, which we don't necessarily take into consideration, but finance is really taking this more and more, is. ESG respectful, so it's to use a minimum uh, and in fact to use the power consumption on an efficient way and try to reduce it. So that's also important because you will see you have different chain consuming lots of power and if you design good this kind of rockets, you can take the good decision to reduce it. So now a second dimension is connect. So when you build this kind of DLT platform, as you see in the middle, it's a platform that is connected to a whole ecosystem and lots of participants. So you will need to connect to their systems. They have different identity provider. They have different channels for communicating. So in the middle, you have the rocket we are building here. So the, I name it the next generation settlement. So settlement is to, to realize the, the transfer of ownership of assets. That kind of platform, as mentioned, trend is to build it on, on the cloud for the infrastructure to use microservices, and you will provide different capabilities like asset services, which is like a corporate service, so paying interest on some bonds. You have primary market, I know it's not a session on finance, so it's where you issue the financial instrument the first time you create it. Secondary market is more where you will trade it, so where different people will buy and sell financial product and then other financial services. And you see that blockchain platform based will interconnect with the whole ecosystem to bank, to issuer that create the bond, to the investor that will buy them, to custodian that, that are managing um, 
the holding of the, the, the financial asset for the customer to central security deposit like Euroclear, which are really the guardian of the issuance of the asset. And then you have also lots of other platforms that are emerging, also being them on the cloud or on the blockchain. So you have also initiative, private blockchain, public blockchain, where also financial instruments are issued, and we need to interconnect with them. And then you have on the right side also all existing big platforms in the financial sector, like Swift, where you send your instruction, I want to sell, I want to buy, I want to transfer uh, shares. Then you have T2S, which is... Um, for uh, clearing house of securities, you have Target 2, you have CBDC platform, so I don't know if people have heard about it, so it's central bank digital currency. There are lots of initiatives creating uh, central bank money based on blockchain platforms, so you have also to take this into consideration, and then you have international CSD platform. So you see this kind of platform, that's, that's also the beauty of it and what makes it fun to work with it. You have to interconnect to lots of different actors using different technologies and protocol. So connect. When designing your, your, your rockets, you have two layers, your blockchain architecture. So what does it mean? So let's, let's zoom a little bit on the design of it. If you, link at, if you look at the pink uh, color, you see the blockchain platform stacks. At the bottom of it, you have the infrastructure. As I mentioned, you will use cloud services, and in cloud services, you will enable lots of services. So you could have Kubernetes, you could enable different PaaS services for database, for managing your, your, your passwords, your uh, private key for signing transaction. Then when you have this foundation layer, so you have your infrastructure, you need to deploy your different DLT nodes. We will see what, what, what they are. And on top of them, you have the smart contract layer. This is really where you start to implement the business logic to deliver the different journey I mentioned at the beginning. And on top of it, you have your interface security and identity access management control. So you need to integrate to the different use case and, and, and journey. So you will have client inter interacting with the platform through UI because nobody will interact. You see blockchain is quite low in the different layers. You will interact it with something user friendly. Is it, is it a mobile application or is it a web app? You still have API, so you have seen the previous slide on Connect. All those actors, they have the existing uh, backend infrastructure, so they would like also to interconnect through API to the platform. And then you have the legacy consumer, so more people acting on legacy platform that could also interact through web app. What's challenging also, because the blockchain work, work on a certain way, but we have to integrate in the financial sector, so this is something really specific to the financial sector, very specific non-IT uh, requirements. So we have hard compliance and regulation. For example, in the case of issuing bonds, so there is a regulation, CSDR, and we have lots of requirements there, quite hard in terms of security, the things we have to log, how we back up things. If there is an issue on this, how we could potentially uh, intervene. You cannot revert on blockchain, but we have to be agile and find smart ways so that we can still uh, act on this. So this is the layer of your, your, your rocket. And then you have to expose. So you have to expose your blockchain platform. Um, here it's a view. It's not the only way, but it's a practice uh, we observe and lots of projects use it to build the different layers of uh, APIs. So if you look at the bottom, the bottom you are really internal in the engine. So you are really the tier zero tech API. You are on a blockchain node. And every blockchain product, like Ethereum, that probably you know it, or R3 Corda, out of the box, those software application, they have API. Most of the time is RPC API, so JSON RPC which is not the more useful way to interact it. So most of the time you create a tier one, so a domain API in order to address, so all your operation to read, write, interact with the smart contract. We prefer doing it with REST uh, API. This kind of components, of course, you can implement it with different technologies. So the trendy one, uh, Node.js, you use uh, .NET Core, uh, C Sharp, also Java and Spring Boot, uh, as example. 
And then you go to the higher layer, which is the Experience API. And on the Experience API, you have two, two aspects for machine-to-machine -machine consumption, so really the different actors, if they want to interact with the backend of the infrastructure. We expose the blockchain platform with specific API for machine-to-machine -machine, uh, interaction. And then you have also the API, so those are composition API. They, they, they make an aggregation of to have the good information for the consumer. And then you have the screen API, which are really API for web application front end, so at the top, the, the, the consumer tier. So those you see, you don't access directly the blockchain. You are still building a stack of API to facilitate composability, also enhance uh, security, also enable you, if in the future you want also to change the blockchain platform, meaning you will change the, the tier zero layer, you are you will not have impact on the higher layer. You don't want to contact your consumer and say, look, we have changed from Ethereum to Corda. Here are the new API. This is the kind of things we want to avoid. So this enables those capabilities. Let's take a little bit time on this, because this is really what's different when building a blockchain-based uh, platform. So here we share, what do we mean by sharing your blockchain platform architecture? In traditional um, application on the financial sector using legacy application, you build a central application that is hosted in the data center, and you have a stack of services in one place. Here, and an attention point, it's a maximalist approach, and I will explain you, you can have an in-the-middle in approach. This is a stack. The difference is that every participant, or you in mind, they were issuer, they were a dealer, to participate in the network, in fact, they will be the platform. So they will host on their sites. I, sh I have shown you the different layers. They will have it on their side. So every participant will have a stack of microservices. So you recognize the infrastructure. So they will decide. So probably they have their own identity provider and access management. They have their own Kubernetes uh, infrastructure. They have their own uh, key vault to hold the, the keys. They have to take the decision on the storage. We let them having this. And then on the different tiers, they will have their own microservice like the blockchain nodes. Uh, on the tier zero, they will have the REST API, we explain it. They will have a Docker for their uh, screen API, and they will have Docker also for the web app. So you see here, every entity is really decentralized and autonomous. They can access the full set of the service locally. So this is the big difference, because building a platform where the actors, in fact, are the platform, that's something really new in, in this industry. Uh, this is a maximalist view, of course. You can go on a gradual way. So we observe some that are federating screen, federating some API, and some nodes also. But it's to explain to you that this is a fundamental shift. You share the platform, so now the participants are part of the platform. So we have seen that first part was on, if you want to build a platform for financial sector on DLT, you have seen we have new uh, architectural pattern and approach that were not used during decades. Those things were not used on the financial sector. So that's quite exciting to use this, to enable those new principles. So let's take uh, now a little bit time on shaping this journey and we will focus on the blockchain, on the key blockchain characteristic to take into consideration when you build this kind of platform. First one, so is the wall more than the sum of its parts? So this is more than a blockchain. Some people think, oh, okay, it's a chain of block, you have transaction, that's it. No, here you have seen also the, the, the model with all the components. We are rather building a network, which is what is the power. So I don't know in the audience how is, who is familiar with blockchain technology to know how, how deep we go or not. So yeah, okay, there are some people. So this, this drawing will not enter, it's not a, a training, but just to give some, some foundation. On the blockchain, it's a network of computer that will run a distributed ledger. So in place of having one central database running somewhere, you will have a set of nodes that will be responsible to give you the equivalence of a central database. So the nodes, 
which are really, it's, it's a processing with a, a software running on it, they make the infrastructure of that blockchain. So the node are constantly, to make their job and have this unique uh, share view, they are constantly exchanging message between each other, and, and the nodes are all running the same software application, what they name protocol, is it Ethereum, Corda, Bezu, whatever of it, all the nodes run exactly the same piece of software, and the job is any time. For example, you are on, a, on the node on the bottom left, and you are a seller, any time you put a, a transaction to sell the financial instrument to someone else, this instruction will be stored on the different nodes. The nodes involve it, so they have also the jobs to record it. So as a general definition, a distributed ledger technology, it enables different parties that don't necessarily trust each other. So you see there is not anymore in the middle a guardian. So it's just actor talking to each others that don't necessarily trust, distributed ledger, enable to have a consensus so that any time you write something, you are sure that everybody has the same information, they share the same, uh, what we say, a fact or data, without any intermediaries. So that just for the foundation, I, I, I stop there. So when you build your, your DLT platform, is there one DLT product that fits all? Unfortunately, the answer is no. There are different kind of, our well, DLT, I forget to, the, to explain this. This acronym they use it is the umbrella. So it's distributed ledger technologies. So that's the big, the big part. And then you have different way to implement it. The, the famous one is blockchain, like Ethereum, uh, Bitcoin, um, Hyperledger, Bezu. Uh, there are a lot of on this. The particularity of this is that they group transactions in block to maintain the immutability, and then they chain the different blocks. But you are not obliged to group transactions in block. There are other type of distributed ledger technology, like DAG, uh, direct acyclic graph. There, they do exactly the same, but in place of grouping. So anytime you, someone is making a financial transaction, in place of grouping all the transactions in block, they just chain the transaction between themselves. So like if you have uh, a financial product, it will change of hands during the, its life cycle. Someone will buy it, another party will buy it, another party will buy it. So we chain uh, all those transactions. You don't need to group them in blocks, so that's the particularity. And then you have other types, just for your curiosity, you have half crash, all the chain tempo, and other lists, so that you know that there are different kinds. And depending on your requirement, you will opt for something it's blockchain-based or direct acyclic graph. Without entering in the detail, on the blockchain, anytime someone in a corner do a transaction, all the participants see it. So that's super cool for redundancy, resiliency, because everybody has all the time a copy. But you could have some pain regarding privacy. These kind of things with graph, you exchange data on a purpose. So if two parties exchange data, only the node of those two parties have the data. So you can have more flexibility for privacy, but then for backup and restore, can be, you could have some challenge on this. So you have to select one. Then the second, uh, it's, it's a question we hear often, is when we build this platform for the blockchain, do we go for a public blockchain? Do we go for a private blockchain? So let's take a time to look at this picture. So you see there are two dimensions. On the vertical dimension, you see the permission aspect. You have permissionless and permission blockchain. What does it mean? It's quite simple. Permission blockchain, it just means that if you want to participate to the network, you, not, you need to knock the door to someone, like an onboarding entity, that will say, okay, you are authorized to use this blockchain. In a permissionless, after this presentation, you, go, you start your laptop, you install an Ethereum client, and you connect to the mainnet. That's done. You need no authorization to do this. So that's that's first dimension. Another dimension is, do we use a private or public infrastructure? So do we place the different nodes on something private? So you're a big financial actors, and you decide to put all your nodes in your private tenant in a specific cloud where you are very strong on security privacy, or you say, no, I could use the internet and put my name on the internet, which is the, 
the case on the right. So you have those two dimensions. If you need a permission to play it, and on the infrastructure, the horizontal way, you go pr uh, private or public. I've taken three cases we observe, but for the regulated financial sectors, we see the trends. I will explain on which one is, is easier to use at this stage. So if we take the number one, so the bottom left corner, so we are on permissioned private network. There you have protocol like uh, Quorum from Consensus or Hyperledger Fabric. We talk about private chain. The characteristic of this, if you decide to use this when you build your, your DLT platform to visit the different use cases I, I, I mentioned, you have really a restricted access. So there is someone here you see, okay, you can onboard, I know who you are, I know you know these this specific nodes. So you are very good on control, you control it. Uh, security is also an advantage. Um, this is quite used for, it's easier to implement regulation constraint and also on performance you can, you can reach quite good results on this. So it's true today, it doesn't mean that it will stay like this in the future. There are quite lots of initiatives that start this way because you really control. And on financial sector with regulated, if you decide to offer regulated services on this, it's not yet easy with regulation to say, you know what, all the ownership of your stuffs are on public note, on internet, that run everywhere, in China, in, uh, in the US, everywhere. And I don't know what they do, but thanks to the protocol, they cannot cheat it. We are not yet there. So there, it's the second point, that's the extreme. So the number two on the bottom right, it's if you decide when you build your rocket to use a public permissionless infrastructure, and there you have all the famous names that you know on the crypto space. So you have Ethereum, Polkadot, Avalanche, Algorand, Cardano, Solana. I can make a long, long list. Those, they are open. You can go back home, you install a node, you are part of the network. Um, they are fully, that, that, that's the maximization of the decentralization. There is really no central actors on the bottom left. There was still someone to onboard, to participate. Here not. And the infrastructure is the internet. There is no private infrastructure used by the financial sector. It's fully public. Um, a little bit complex, as I mentioned, today there are still initiatives more for non-regulated financial assets where you don't need to comply with regulation, then there are initiatives there. And then you have a, in the middle, the number three is, it's a little bit the compromise, but again, there are journeys going there, it's to say, okay, I still put my note on the internet because that's easier to interact with them, but I put permission on it. So in place of having one entity, this kind of what they name, it's a consortium network, um, you have a group of entities, legal entities, that are a little bit the guardian and that dictate the rule. They say, you can onboard, you are excluded, but otherwise the nodes are on the, on the internet. So you have to take decision and Arch Recorder, for example, can little bit play on both. So private permission or also consortium one, they are good cases. So you see if you go from right to left, it depends where you put the trust. If you go to the right side, it means that if you want to build your rocket based on those, you really trust the network. So you have confidence that it's a big ecosystem, the number of nodes on the internet are enough spread so that you can trust it. So it's really the trust is on the network effect, the size of it, the community. So like Ethereum is very big, lots of developers on it, spreading is not so bad. If you go from left to right, so this is something more close, you have more control. So you see it's more control, you focus on security and, and, and performance. Then is the question, all those know, they discuss how do you want to come to an agreement? So anytime a transaction is passed, how are you sure that all the nodes copy the same on the node? So this is what we mean, the consensus is fine, an agreement. I will try to not enter in the detail. Here are five, four big names we hear a lot. So proof of work, this you can be reassured, this was the old stuff used by Bitcoin and still six months ago by Ethereum. It was the maximization where anytime you put a transaction, you relied on hard computer power, com uh, uh, you consume lots of energy. That's the way you ground that everybody has the same view and you can cheat it. Good. 
good things, most of the projects, financial sector, they don't use this. So this we are okay regarding uh, the ESG point previously mentioned. Then you have different variants, practical Byzantine fault around, proof of stake, proof of authority. Those are different ways to vote, to validate a uh, transaction. Practical Byzantine fault tolerance is a little bit a principle, so you have the, all the different participants, they set transaction, but you need a way to validate them so that everybody has the same view. Here, you put the principle like there is like a leader, a commander, you give him the information and he will send it to the different nodes, and those nodes will sign the transaction and send back to the one who posts. And based on the majority rule, if they send a transaction and 95% of the nodes sign it, say it's fine, then you are sure it's okay. And you turn this every, so you change the leader, so that's a way to do it. And then you have those two, proof of stake, proof of authority. Proof of stake, because all, all those mechanisms is to be sure that nobody is no note when they receive a transaction. If I sell a bond to a B party, I will not be happy if the notes change it and sell from me to a C party. So it's to avoid this kind of, 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 uh, of hacking. Proof of stake, to avoid this, as a note, you have to put money on the table. So any time you validate a transaction, you put money on the table. And if you don't respect the rule or you, you modify the transaction, sorry, you lost your money. So you see it's a way to control cheating about these kind of things. And proof of authority is a little bit the same, but only used in the previous category in a permissioned network. Here, you vet on your reputation. You just sign your note, you just put your signature on the transaction, that's it. But if you don't respect the rule, because it's a permission network, the onboarding authority will say, Tata, you, are, you have done something wrong, and you will be excluded from the network. So, and this, the nice thing is, depending on the protocol you use, so like I mentioned, for example, Ethereum, you can configure it when you deploy it. For example, you can deploy it on a proof of work, or you can activate it proof of stake, or if you deploy it in your own data center, you can activate proof of authority. Not all the protocols support all the all those stuff. For example, Art Recorder is more proof of authority uh, oriented. So those are mechanisms to be sure that everybody has the same view when you write a uh, transaction on the blockchain. And then the last point, because here we are still on the part where we focus on, on key characteristics of really your, your blockchain part of, of, your, of your rocket platform. How do you want to develop your smart contract? So everybody talk about our smart contract. It's all first, it's a bad, bad name, it's not smart contract. It's more, if you compare it to classical monolithic application, you have your database and then you have your business logic running on top of it anytime you want to read and write. In place of doing it, smart contracts, what was the idea is to do exactly the same. It's your business logic, but in place of running in centrally in one place, you will plug it on your DLT network and you run this piece of code on every node. So it's really the guardian that's you respect the rule of the business. It's any time you perform a read operation. Uh, what does it, another analogy, concretely when you deploy your DLT, so let's say you have R3 code and nodes, uh, every, if you deploy a smart contract, let's say for selling, for uh, exchanging bonds or securities versus cash, so managing this kind of transaction, you develop in code, so let's let's stay for the, there are other technologies, but I take here for the illustration, the art recorder. There are guys that will develop in Java or Kotlin, what they name um, a core app or a smart contract. This piece of code, then it will be a jar. It's a unique one. All the different nodes will use this one. So we don't do a different one. We do one for use case. And thanks to that application, it will grant that any time we exchange the ownership of securities versus uh, cash, it is respectful. So if we zoom a little bit, so you, you could tell me, but yeah, but what is it concretely, a smart contract? If I take the example of, of R3 Corda, you have three components. So let's say you have, and these concretely are classes. So you have a first, you could have multiple, but those are the three categories. You will have a states uh, class, 
which is really where you define your different object. Here I mentioned securities, cash. So you define your data model there. There you have your contract class, classical object-oriented class, where you define the rules that govern how do states can be modified. Like for example, if I send a security some, to someone, we could verify if there is no anti-money laundering issue, if this specific entity uh, is well owning the, the, the financial asset instrument they pretend. And then you have a last class, which is the flow. The flow is really, that's, that's the cool stuff on, on R3, on the different protocols, you have to implement some out of the box. Here it's part of the decentralized application. It's really the sequencing, because when you exchange, you have, to, uh, you have a node of a seller and a node of a buyer. There is still lots of sequence of information that I exchange. This is what the, the flow class do. It helps you to exchange information, creating transactions, signing it. So for the illustration, I, I took two flows. If you look at the first one, the, the initiator, let's say I have a node one, which is the, the, the seller, so it owns um, a financial product like a bond, and you want to sell it to a buyer, which is the other line. They have both nodes, both a CODA protocol running on it, and they have both the smart contract. On the seller side, what I have to do is to post my transaction, my intention. I want to sell these specific securities for this price to this B party. So this is what I put as get data from internal service. And I create this transaction, this blob of information, and then I sign it with my cryptographic keys. From that part, you need to exchange it. So you send it to the other parties, which has like a listener application on the side. They receive the transaction, they open it, it's a blob of, inf of information. But then they don't trust each other, so he will again verify it. So he has the smart contract, he will run the smart contract and see if it respects the rule. If this guy is well owning the securities he pretend, if he's well authorized, all these kind of things. If it's okay, he put his signature, he commit, he send it back to the other party, so to the, the message come back to the issuer. And the issuer do the same, he will inspect, he will look at the transaction and if that's fine, then they can anchor it. I have skipped one detail where you contact a, a, a notary on here. So you see the, the beauty of this kind of, oh, I could stop here, I think it's a little bit small and time is going fast, so I will not go in the detail, but it was for the, because most of the time people say, yeah, but what does it look like exactly um, a smart contract? So here it's an export from um, a code app written in Java, and here is the call method. It was just to show you that by, that by the end, what's nice, you don't need to reinvent all the wheel. So, for example, R3 Corda, they have made libraries so that you can call specific method to sign transaction, to construct transaction, so re you remind the flow. So here, without entering in the detail, you have a first stage where you create the transaction. To create the transaction, so the transaction builder, you have method from the libraries of Art Recorder, then you sign transaction again, you create sign it transaction object, but you have method also from, from Art Recorder. That, that's, that's the cool stuff. Then when the transaction is created, and I don't want to spend time here, you need to exchange it, and I mentioned class flow. Then you create a flow object at the bottom, we see other party session flows. You create a session and then you sign them the transaction and you wait, they send it back to you, assign it transaction object. So you see, if you are good developers in Java or Kotlin, if you start making code app, you, you just do data modeling and you use existing components of underlying uh, libraries. And the last one on the focus, how do you want to interact with the blockchain platform? Because you still need to read and write. And here is the wallet concept, which is also a key component. A wallet, it's a piece of software that can be combined, for financial sector is combined with the hardware, and that help you to interact with the DLT. So in summary, they generate your key. So anytime you put a transaction, I want to sell, for example, a bond that I own, of course, I need to have something secure, I need to sign it with my private key. So every participant has a couple of keys to control his financial asset product or cash token. So generating key, it enables you to see your balance, so how many of a specific securities you have, how many of cash. 
and also it enables you to create and sign your transaction as mentioned. We use most of the time, that's something quite funny to put in place, uh, HSM, which are uh, hardware material for storing the keys, uh, like Luna HSM. So there also you have to design in the cloud rather than active, active uh, HSM infrastructure, initiate your keys, and then when you have this HSM, you need to connect them to your node. So that's also quite quite funny journey when, when you set up this kind of, of, of technologies. And here you remind, we have seen new architecture principle. I was on the rocket focusing only on the blockchain part. But there are lots of other things, so that's what's cool in this journey. To support that journey, you have to have security gateways because you don't expose to the world a financial platform based on blockchain. So you need to secure, to protect against DOS attacks or whatever uh, kind of attack. You need also to have identity and access control management to identify who can access, what are the rights they have. You have all your front end and back end. You need an infrastructure, so you use Kubernetes, you have your pipeline. Uh, you need to put in place your storage because I mentioned, okay, you have a golden source, you, they all share the same view on a database, but you need every node needs to store the, those kind of data. You need to protect also your API, so you put some API gateway. And as we are on a journey to put a rocket based on DLT for financial sector regulated one, you really need to monitor all the different aspects end to end. From the moment someone who submits an instruction, when, through which component, does it go, does it succeed? So we have to lock all those kind of things. You need also a tool to operate this. What happens if we have a problem, if we have to do backup and restore? Those are really big machinery running live with, with financial transaction. And then you have a long list of supporting path services depending on what you select. So really to deploy all those stuff. So it was just to say that the blockchain part of your rocket that's just the visible part. The cool stuff when you're on board on this journey is that you touch all those things. So that's for tech guys, that, that, that's quite uh, interesting. So now let's finish with some lesson learned from that journey. What are the challenge and key point when you decide to go to this journey of, build, of building a DLT-based uh, rocket? So three key challenges. First, the first one is don't be blockchain maximalist. So don't do blockchain for blockchain. This is an error everybody do. They say, ah, oh, we are blockchain, let's do everything on blockchain. So here you have really to take the time when business comes, they come with a new use case, discuss with your business analyst and see really if and where a blockchain can provide value. So do you really need uh, immutability? Do you need logging of the stuff? Do they want to have self-control? So do they want to have self-sovereignty? Because there are some data where it's not needed. So off-chain storage is still present. Big data platform, we still need them. So this kind of rocket doesn't fit for all use case. So it's not going, it's an error that lots of maximalists do. They say, oh, everything will be blockchain based. No. They, we see they have value for the, some specific use cases, but not all. The second one is interoperability. We are still on early days of interoperability. So there are lots of initiatives trying to find a way, so if different financial actors are creating their own rocket to offer a specific financial product, is it cash, CBDC, securities, there are still lots of room and investigation how if you issue a product on one platform, how can you send it to the other platform? So there are gateways that I use, there are cross-chain protocol, they are even looking to principle where you issue a securities on one platform, how can you send it to the other one? Some are locking it on that platform and then they reissue it on the other way. And if you want them back, you burn them on the destination and you send back. So you see there are lots of activities, which is quite fascinating because it's a really active uh, community and, 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 and solution I emerge in. And the last one is what I mentioned, blockchain is really only the visible part of the iceberg. So if I could, I'm not a crystal ball, but if I had to give a percentage, so we had focus on blockchain characteristics, these specific jobs is probably 30% of the effort of building this kind of platform. Because lots of people say, ah, oh, cool, I know if I take uh, Ethereum, I know Solidity, take my laptop, I code uh, a smart control, it's finished. 
really easy to go cool, cool product. This is what they do in the decentralized finance and, 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 and the crypto space. But if you want to be really compliance on the regulated financial sector, you have seen you still need more layers to grant some compliance with auditability, traceability, security, and this kind of things. And then three pain points doesn't mean that it's blocking, but you have to be prepared for those. For tech guys, that's cool because it's it's nice challenge. First, building efficient, I would say more CDCI, it's, it's, it's good. Building efficient CD pipeline for this kind of platform. So you have seen the amount of components. There are software components that you develop. There are out of the box components like the blockchain node, and there are all the infrastructure components now that you also deploy. It's it's quite complex and it requires time to, to have maturity on, on, on this. So be patient. You cannot, from day one, with a team, having a maturity where you see this rocket with all the different components at any stage. You have different environment, your dev, your test, that you have all automation pipeline to deploy it real time without any problems. It takes time. It's a must, but be patient. Progressively, maturity comes with the team. Second one is integration testing. The sooner, the better. You have seen all those components. It's better to start a journey with just one feature, like putting a transaction on the ledger. You still not do the settlement of them. Already tried end-to-end -end testing. So don't wait, but people do it. <laughs> so you need to, to leave them and see it in real. You let all your dev develop all the components and you are fine, then you put all with your, your pipeline or even manually in dev environment. And then at the end you say it's fine and then you ask BA, a quality tester, to come and nothing worse because you have seen the pattern. You have to submit a transaction through API, go to identity provider, get GUT token, then go through all the layers of the API, they have to work. Then you reach the DLT, you have to call an HSM, keep your key, sign the transaction, then it has to go to all the nodes. So these kind of things, it works perfectly, but don't wait too long because the longer you wait, the harder it will be. And then the pluggable, the, the non-functional requirements, that's, <laughs> that's also a tricky part. If I would say in one sentence, find a good balance. Because if you implement, so what do, we, do I mean by non-functional requirement? It's like hard security requirement from the regulated finance, a performance, scalability you don't need from day one for your first use case, uh, for your first journeys, uh, stories, to already implement a rocket with the big booster, the capability to support the uh, 10,000 transactions per second, go by steps. But don't do it too late. So it's really a balance. Enable just what you need for the use case and then improve progressively. Otherwise, if you do it too late, it's a too big tech debt. And if you did too early, you will be blocked and you will never be agile and fast. And to give you our coming to conclusion is exploring the galaxy. So can we visit the different use case I mentioned, building a DLT-based uh, platform or rocket? The answer is yes, with the but. You have seen, we have seen the first, a list of new architecture principle and pattern. You have to follow them. You have seen also the different characteristics for the DLT, the decision, go public, private, uh, the protocol you use. You, also, you have seen also some challenge and key point. You have to take those. But if you take those into consideration, yes, you can, thanks to smart contract, replace money by a smart contract, which is programmable, where you can dictate new rules. You have more flexibilities. It's more liquid. Regarding financial instrument, it's the same. It's at the end of a smart contract. You can, and you tokenize the financial instrument, and you can automatize lots of things, control things. Yes, you can take, so today, an account balance or the amount of security you own is recorded on a database, but you can replace it with a cryptographically digital token. Yes, you can do in Santander settlement thanks to the smart contract. So at the same moment, you are sure you change your ownership of the seller and the buyer because that's a problem. Someone sell, but it doesn't, uh, someone buy, but it doesn't have the money and receive the securities. You can be sovereign on it thanks to the, um, the private public key I mentioned. So the finance beneficial owners control their assets. 
and this one is really something we observe. So all those techniques, protocols, they have been invented from the guys from the DeFi sector, the DeFi sector. So we are really observing all the crypto space as really a life uh, lab, and they are really leading all the, the innovation there. So thank you for the time. Don't hesitate to scan this. So we are looking for lots of technical guys. If you want to participate in this kind of journey, you've seen it's lots of protocol technologies. Feel free to go for it. We need people. You can visit us. So thanks for your time, attention. Sorry, I'm just on time. So if you have questions, I don't know if it's authorized. Otherwise, please visit us. Thank you.